One of the challenges with using ChatGPT in real life is the fact that it was only trained on public domain data up until September 2021. So, you know, what if there's a bunch of files, documents sitting on your company's servers that you would like to ask GPT about? It has no knowledge of that information. What's the right way of getting that information into GPT? So today we're going to be testing out a plugin that I think works pretty well. It's pretty simple to use. And of course, in a real corporate environment, um, for security reasons, you may not want to choose to use a third party application like this. So we're also going to be digging into and reverse engineering how the plugin works and how you can build your own. Um, so here we go. If we, uh, here we've got a GPT-4. I'm going to be using that as my base model today. And so here I'm going to be asking it about um, the improvements that Soar Properties has made since 2019 on a metric called EUI across its retail portfolio. And since I know the report was not published since, uh, until 2022, GPT shouldn't be able to tell me anything about this. And let's see, let me just switch off. So no plugins enabled, just the base model. So as expected, it's telling me that it does not have real-time uh, access to current or proprietary databases, and so it can't really answer my question. So now let's uh, let's look at Swire's uh, website. So in this investor relations section, there's a, a ESG a section with lots of PDFs with uh, publicly available information. So climate-related financial disclosures. Let's look at this document. Lots of information here, and then when we scroll down towards the back, it's got some tables with metrics on it. So let's let's look at this one. So you can hear, see here, electricity use intensity by gross floor area measured in kilowatts per uh, kilowatt hours per square meters per year. And you can see in Hong Kong, it's gone from 139 down to 117. In the States, it's gone from 237 down to 179. So what we're going to do is to copy this URL and uh, we're going to start a new chat. We're going to use GPT-4 because that's the only model that has access to plugins. So we're going to enable a plugin called Ask Your PDF. Please use this PDF for reference. So I'm going to just paste in that URL. So now you can see that in, instead of um, looking at its own knowledge base, it's now reaching out to the plugin called Ask Your PDF, and it's communicating with Ask Your PDF. And while we're waiting for it, you might wonder, hey, why don't we just copy and paste all the additional information that we want ChatGPT to have inside the prompt here? then it would have access to the information. And you would be absolutely right. However, there is something called a maximum token length. And so there's a maximum amount of information that you can paste into the prompt. And so if you have large PDFs, hundreds of pages, maybe hundreds, thousands of PDF documents, pasting it into the prompt would not be a valid way of achieving that, that goal. So here you can see that now that I've given it a link to that PDF, it was able to tell me that uh, the EUI has decreased from 139 in 2019 to 117, which is correct, um, as we saw in the table uh, previously. And likewise, these numbers are all correct. It summarized all of this for me. And it was able to tell me which pages the information was found on. That's a pretty good response. So one of the tricks here when you use plugins is you can click on these down arrows to see the communication between ChatGPT and the third-party plugin. So what ChatGPT sent to the plugin so you can see this query here. Let me zoom in a little bit. But it turned my request into improvements in the electricity use intensity since blah, 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 blah. And then asked uh, your PDF's response in, involved a number of uh, pages of text extracted from the PDF that I gave it. So you can see here it's got uh, page 19, it's got page 5, page 4, page 17, 18. There's a total a total of 20 pages, but it only returned five pages. So somehow it was able to identify that these five pages is relevant to my query and then gave all that information to chat, GTP, uh, chat uh, GPT. And then chat GPT was able to craft this much more organized answer to my query. And so one of the keys to how this works is something called embeddings. Uh, uh, another term for it is called semantic search. So based on this method of search, we uh, this third party plugin was able to take a lot of information and then extract from it the sections that are relevant to then pass to chat gpt so that's why we're able to not exceed that maximum token length that i mentioned so now that we've seen it work in action let's have a chat about how this works 
if you go to um, OpenAI's website and go to the platform section, you'll see that they have actually more products other than GPT. They have this thing called embeddings. It's embeddings is basically a service where I can send OpenAI a paragraph uh, or a page or a sentence of text, any length, and it will give me back a list of numbers. And this list of numbers is um, supposed to represent the meaning of that paragraph or that sentence. And um, they also call these, these list of numbers vectors. So if you have two paragraphs and two vectors, if you look at the difference between the two vectors, if they're very similar, then it means that the two paragraphs are similar in meaning. But if the vectors are very different, then it means the two paragraphs are largely unrelated to each other. And this is how they do um, how that plugin extracted those five pages from the 20 pages of PDF that I sent it. it. It was able to extract those pages based on the semantic meaning. And it's very different from historical ways of doing text search where we use keywords or maybe even like synonyms. So only if you mention the keyword and if the keyword exists in on that page, would it be deemed um, relevant? But here, embeddings makes it a lot more intelligent. So before we dig into the code, I thought we'd just do a quick reminder of what vectors are. So do you remember this thing from high school called two-dimensional vectors? So it'd be something like this. If it's two-dimensional, then it's uh, two numbers. And then let's say we have two vectors, uh, three and then eight. Okay. So if we were to plot this on a in a two-dimensional space, Let's see, two is here, let's see, one, two, three, and then let's see, two, four, and then I double that, like eight. So this first point is here, this other point is here, and then, um, so that's the first vector. And then this is the, that's a bit tricky, e, second vector. So when you um, look at the difference between two vectors, there are different ways of doing it. Um, the one that you probably remember from high school is something called like the Euclidean distance, where you do this minus this squared plus this minus this squared and the square root it is the distance of this. But in uh, natural language, what people seem to like to use is something called a cosine similarity, which is basically just the angle between these two vectors. And that means they don't take the length of the vector into consideration, it's just the direction of the vector. So if it's the pointing in the same direction, it means uh, semantically it's similar in meaning. So yeah, that's cosine similarity. Now let's turn to the code. So here I'm using a tool by Google called Collaboratory Notebook. It's, um, it's really cool because it works a little bit like Google Docs. You just type into it, it's cloud-based, but instead of just typing text, you can type code and then you can just run it by clicking play. And this is great for prototyping, trying out things without having to install all kinds of stuff on your own computer. And um, people also use this to, to do a lot of machine learning and analytics work. So here, um, because our code will need to be talking to OpenAI to use their embedding service. So we'll first need to install this OpenAI library. Um, so we just play that and it's gonna install and it pretty much already did it before. And then once it's installed, um, in order for us to use um, the libraries that we need, we need to import it. And then we need to um, tell OpenAI that we have an account and we have the rights to use it and, and we pay for it. So we need to pass in the API key. Um, I've hidden my key here, so I'm just gonna play that. But basically what's in there is something that looks like this, that you need to stick your own, your own key in here. And then to just verify that it works, we're going to talk to, Open AI, uh, talk to OpenAI to give us a list of engines that we have access to back, just, just to make sure that it's, it's working. And, and it is like, oh, we have like, Da Vinci, Babbage, blah, 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 GPT. Okay, so that's not useful to us anymore. And um, to show you like a kind of toy example of embeddings in action, I've created a set of sample data of three news articles. So you can see the first line is a news article about the Belgian prime minister who uh, fell off his bike. He lost consciousness, but, um, but he was fine. So that was like an accident. Uh, the second one is about Germany sending warships in 2024 to Indo-Pacific uh, amid South China Sea tensions. It's, let's see, so something to do with the geopolitical tension between China and Taiwan. And then finally, the, uh, the last article is about Pixar uh, cutting 75 jobs. So I kind of show you this text because um, when we write our queries later on to see 
which one of these articles gets returned as being the most relevant, you'll be able to see that we actually mention no, no keywords that exist in the text here. And it's still able to um, identify which one is the most similar. So now that we've defined our sample data and set it to this variable, we're going to define the model that we're going to use for the embedding, which we've set here. And then now we're calling OpenAI to create the embeddings. So we're sending it the sample data, we're tell, telling it to use this model and give us back three vectors that represent these three articles. And so it'll be stored within this variable called res, uh, and it, res is a data type called dictionary. So it's the vectors are actually a little bit embedded inside this dictionary, but uh, don't really need to worry about that. But if we play that, you'll see that we got three vectors back and each vector has 1,536 numbers. It means it is like a very high dimensionality vector, which means it can cover a lot of different meanings. It is every direction is a different meaning. And then if you want to see what's actually in one embedding, I can just pull the first one out. This is the one that represents this Belgian prime minister falling off his bike. You can see it's just a list of numbers, floating point numbers and 1,500 of them. And this next bit, you don't need to worry about. I'm just pulling it out in the format that makes it easier for us to use. All right, so in this next section, we're gonna do something fun, which is uh, write some queries, and then we're going to turn our query into an, a vector. And then in this section, we're going to compare our query vector with the, three, the vectors of each of the three articles to see which one is the closest to what we asked. And so if we try this one, were there any accidents in the news today? And in my mind, I'm thinking about the bike fall, but nowhere in that text did, was the word accidents mentioned at all. So if we play this, we'll get the embedding back for the sentence. And I've put it in this variable called query embedding. And then in this section, we've asked, um, we're looping through each of the three articles and then taking the cosine distance between each article and our query and then we're doing one minus. So the higher the number, the closer the, the meaning. So let's just play this. Wow, you can see it's 0 0.79, it came back. This, uh, the first one, which is correct. And then if we change the query, what happened today relating to Sino geopolitical issues? So again, and talk about South China Sea or even mention the word China, just play this. See, it came back with the second one, 0 0.79, the warships. And then let's look at this third one. Were there any layoffs in the news today? Oh, I forgot to run this. It came back with the last one. Hmm. Let's, let's try another one on the fly. Let's see, query, query. Um, are, are there any news articles related to vehicles? I'm thinking the first one. <laughs> huh? Easy. Yes. Let's see. Um, related to the C. So this should come back with the second one. Oh, there we go. So that's how embeddings work. And if you were to implement something like this in your company, and obviously you'd have a lot more than just three, three articles, you might have millions of pieces of data sitting in your database you can use something called a vector database to convert these uh, these things into vectors, store it into that database. And then the, there's some technology around the indexing, which makes it very efficient for, um, for it to do these uh, cosine similarity comparisons. And of course you might, you might say, hey, I don't wanna send all this stuff to open AI and I don't wanna use their embedding API to turn it into embeddings. Um, there'll be models out there that you can run and host yourself that can, that can create these embeddings. So that's how you can create your own Ask a PDF plugin.